Well, thank you. Not only for your words, Gideon, but also I'd like to thank the organizers for this first symposium, so powerful. And Guillem said so. Yesterday, I was at, in hospital as a patient. And, well, thank you for the effort you have made to have the enormous figures we have here today who represent an enormous current, an enormous current of arts in health these days. I loved what has been said today, Christopher Bailey, and also our colleagues from Yeda, our colleague from the Jordi Gold Foundation, because we are traveling a road based on complicity, on a complicity, but also the synergies of creating networks, as Anna said, that are so important to create this roadmap of initiative actions and assessments. Today, we will present a piece of work and Teresa Gonzalez did it with us. We started in 2018. Our first discussions in 2019, we worked on, should I get closer to the mic? Can you hear me well? Yes. So we started working in 2019, intense work to create complicity and a common shared language between uh, the network, the museums, and health, and a specific type of health, mental health, to be able to carry out this study. And for this study, we could do it just before the COVID pandemic, during the first phase, but we could also continue with the assessment during the first year of COVID, which had this double-fold aspect of being an accompaniment, a coaching for these people, but also to know what tools had been useful for them what they learned during the intervention to face something as unheard of as a pandemic, uh, lockdown, and different type of losses. So this has been published, and that's why Guillaume mentioned that it's in open access. You can access it. This is just the title of the presentation. And if anybody has difficulties to reach this article, please just tell us, and we will send it to you. No worries, no problem. As Anna has just said, we asked to have the authorization of our bioethics committee and something that's very relevant that Christopher said this morning, the resources. This is made up of resources, of human resources in the sense of love, commitment. There is no financial return, there is no financial support, but we were very much supported by both institutions, the Val de Bron Hospital and the National Museum of Art in Catalonia. It's very important to think that we were going to work with women, which is what we wanted. Our target group was were women from a cultural context that's very different from ours. And as we knew at a clinical level, in terms of the care model they were receiving at the hospital, they came with situations that were perfectly well framed in a diagnostic called the post-traumatic complex. This is one of the worst diagnostic, uh, worst diagnoses that we have. They had all gone through terrible migration processes. All of them had financial difficulties, social difficulties, etc., etc., which made us think from a vision, those of us who are in general culture, which is called the intersectionality. And to think these stresses as active stresses, not past stresses. Migration processes were still present. Cultural language differences, precariousness, l social support lacks. This is like a big l load on their backs. And the idea was to create these spaces for in which they felt safe and well. I'm not going to tell you about what the stress survey is. It is a diagnosis, which is part of the post-traumatic stress, but it is maintained in time. And in addition to the other diagnosis of re-experimentation, 
um, dissociation, etc., etc. There is a, a very big emotional deregulation and difficulties in other and their interpersonal relationships. And that makes it very difficult for these people to have a diagnosis. And the other point is that we had to think about how to make an approach that's based on a well-verified evidence, which is a model that should be brief for group interventions. And we thought about a model that had a lot of evidence in the English-speaking world, but that did, have, that did not have an evidence in our world or in our language. It's called the SAR model. And in that model, and all of the documents we have brought forward, you see that the first part is more uh, training. I mean, it's a model actually modeled by Marlene Cloitra. She's a PhD in psychology. And she said that oftentimes people with complex post-traumatic stress cannot talk about their experiences in plural. But they are able to learn to regulate some of the difficulties they have. For example, the emotional regulation. And this is very wide scoping. And we will see how she works it out. And also to modulate the relationships that they generate with the rest of their environment. There is a course, the, an internet course that's given. And you have the link here or the reference. It's in English. It's a very interesting course. And it's open to all of the audience with a final score. This is the book by Dr. Chloe Tripp, who also brings forth more information about other studies applied to the model. And here you have the document that we generated internally between the museum, the, the National Art Museum, with a team of Teresa Gonzalez and the educators from the Education Department at the museum and ourselves. Well, we tried to adapt and take care at the same time of the original model of INSER with the idea of making it, make it more accessible to all of the target population, i.e. the patients with whom we wanted to work. There is also document uh, documents that we generated. We have Dr. Cloitra's approval in the first group that could make the cultural adaptation for this model. Out of all of this, in the future, if you want to ask anything about it, please, I'll be delighted to answer you. Mark, given the tradition of community-based work, to them, it was very simple to adapt it to the model of arts in health because the museum for many, many years has been working in integration projects, projects that are very much related to promoting the proximity of the museum to the community needs and to raise awareness amongst different age groups and different contexts, et cetera, et cetera. We also believe that the intervention in the museum was very powerful because from our Western point of view, our anthropocentric point of view, we thought that the museum was a place for these women. It's especially good space in the sense that it gets them closer to a non-health, non-stigmatizing space and very much integrated with the community and with high prestige, in which mental health implies that it had to be, it, it had to be a good project. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. Instead of the eight weeks of the original model, we extended it to 10 weeks. One initial weekly session for the integration of the group to, so that they got to know each other. Then the blocks, which are four sessions about emotional regulation and four sessions about the improvement of interpersonal relationships and then a closing session. Now, the main hypothesis for us was that that design started out from the basis of verifying the efficiency of this model when it is transferred to the current culture for these women in that context, in which we saw a comparison between a group that we would develop in the space that they already knew, the hospital, compared to another group that would be combined with the museum's educators with a methodology that they manage very, very well, which is the visual thinking system, the visual thinking system, and our approach of techniques, of our techniques. We highlighted in that comparison that is the fact that we were very sure that the people who would come to the museum would have not only the same efficiency with regards to the model, but they would also feel more adhered and a quality of life related to what belongs to the community. 
a sense of satisfaction with regards to this model compared with those that were still following the type of treatment only within the hospital walls. For us, that comparison to be able to do it in different fields was very relevant, and it was always thought from what we could call a pilot project. We developed a methodology based on uh, rescuing a number of women, a lot of whom had already been subjected to a treatment within a program we call a transcultural program a transcultural psychiatry and others that came from the program I coordinate, which is a traumatic stress program. One of the conditions was to have a better understanding of Spanish or Catalan, at least to understand the proposals and to maintain a, a, a group coherence, because a group can be a great promoter, but if you do not have this interaction model, it could be a hurdle for their participation. We have decided not to give them too many questionnaires, but it's very important that we had a pre-intervention, a post-intervention, and a follow-up throughout one year. You may well imagine that these women, when they started the assessment project, they were just like us with regards to COVID. Therefore, they were locked down. They were in a situation of difficulty, a lot of them with very difficult dwelling unit conditions, physical problems, material problems, not being able to go to work, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We interviewed twice the amount of people we could integrate in the groups, and we worked with 13 women initially in one group and 13 women in another group. In the publication, you will see a number of demographic and social data about these women, for example, that in a questionnaire, that measures the amount of trauma events they had, they go above three or four times the general population. So that w implied an internal con con consistency with regards to the diagnosis they had received. Their birthplaces, you will see the enormous diversity. The m their mother tongues were, were very diverse, very diverse. We had people from Africa, Eastern countries, South, Af South America, Northern Africa, etc. We had a migration status that was quite weak for them. Some of them had asked for asylum, and they had not got a refugee status yet, and they had been working on it for many years. Some of them had residence permits, but not all of them. The self-perceived situation in terms of the financial level was very low, except for one, the rest had children, and many children did not live with them, so that's also a uh, reason for mourning, and and I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak faster because here, in terms of results, th we, here we differentiate according to groups, and then I'll explain why we have the group as a whole. A group that, as you can see, we assessed mainly in terms of the trauma, stress, traumatic stress, symptomatology, anxiety, or the symptoms, depression symptoms they had, and also their quality of life and their satisfaction. That was part of our hypothesis. You can see here how initially anxiety and depression were at a very high levels and how that was being regulated or adjusted throughout time, which means that at the end of this assessment process, one year after the project had been finished, we had a footnote a qualification by the participants that was very positive in terms of their symptoms. Something that's very relevant to and that surprised us very much is that the symptomatology of traumatic stress expressed by them was not that significant. It was not as high as we had thought originally. But at the end, they had a very clear awareness about the symptoms and even the coincidence of the fact that the post-assessment was done when the group said farewell well, there was a re-experiencing or acuteness of that symptomatology. But what's also very interesting, in spite of finding themselves in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we saw how they were they kept at a low level these symptomatology levels, both in terms of avoidance, anxiety, and depression in uh, 
the situation. What happened to the quality of life? You can see it here. Very interesting how the quality of life initially was very low and how both groups improved the quality of life with some differences that are not associated to the groups. Not because of the randomness or the randomization of the group, we're going to say that, but due to other factors linked to the COVID situation. And now we are thinking as a conclusion, what happened to our goals? Of course, we attained our goals, we achieved our goals. We divide, we divided both group, divided them into two groups, and how we could apply in an, an original and new way a model that had never been applied. Well, that had what we expected: an efficiency over these women in terms of their symptomatology, of a core group of symptomatology of the women who had a complex post-trauma stress. But in terms of symptomatology. Let's make a leap forward of the hypothesis which ha which we had, which was with less satisfaction. They did not reach a satisfaction that's significantly better than in the museum compared to the hospital. And it made us wonder and ask them, is there something you're not telling us? I mean, there's a, this qualitative assessment. They said, well, the museum is like a palace. I mean, our concept, when people said, okay, let's go to the museum to do this or that and to have our own gaze as people who live in Catalonia, who know this museum, we love this museum. It is a palace, but it's an open palace. It's not a closed palace. That was very different from the vision they had. To them, this was a palace, but it was a palace that was very difficult to access. It was a palace that even though the facilities that were, were given to them, it actually overwhelmed them. We told, we, 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 we told the museum authorities that when we actually carry out uh, another exercise like this one, and, and I can tell you we can now instrumentalize the changes in this project for the intervention of health in, in arts or arts in health, to, I mean, we have to let these women get to know better the museum before starting our actions. The experience which we promoted is the fact that it's not an unknown space for them, and none of them had ever visited the museum ever before. Therefore, it was a barrier that not only could be over overcome in one day, but no, we had to work on it at the hospital. They knew each other, but at the hospital, at the hospital is as difficult to access as here. But they had had the previ a previous hospital experience, but they had not had a previous museum experience. So it's very relevant that for each one of these experiences, when we assess them, we should assess not only what happens with people with whom we carry out the intervention, but what happens with all of the project. And the project, we can say, was a successful project, and the results are quite optimal. I mean, we even have a pilot project, but we need to improve. I mean, there is room for improvement. You know, the, uh, let, letting these women become familiarized with uh, an environment they didn't know. I mean, to them, it was a big challenge to come here. We need to ease how to make them feel at home, a part of them, as if it were the, the third home. And these results are quite promising, but they are also results in a very small-sized group. Therefore, we have to make a leap forward in terms of results, and we have to think, okay, these are promising results, but what should we do? Therefore, what science tells us is, okay, let's widen the sample. Let's extend the sample, and now we are having conversations to be able to replicate and extend this project, not only with women with different cultural backgrounds, but also other groups, because the main challenge has already been done at the hospital with the Ministry of Culture and Education here, or the Department of Culture and Education here at the museum, and therefore we know we have already traveled off a road, and we need to value it, because we have done a lot of work, we have had many meetings to create this complicity, as Rosé said, and we need to give them the space and the promotion it requires. And therefore, the point is not only to limit ourselves to a specific group, but to extend it to others and to widen our sample, because that's what we want. Arts in health should be what we should promote, not only today, but also in the future. And as Anna also said, we should not only limit ourselves to the quantitative aspects of a scientific study, i.e. the publication, and we can actually 
send it to you. But that's not what's most relevant about what has been published in, uh, like, for example, the Journal of Trauma and Treatment, which is a high impact journal. And the article is being widely discussed, but we should also be able to transfer it with the quality and the warmth that this background work that has been done could have in terms of the value that it has for all of us and so that we can share it with all of you. Therefore, we need to implement some changes. We need to learn from our experience. That's what we should all do. We should disseminate the results, not only in the scientific literature, but also in spaces like this first international meeting, we need to create a new target groups to be able to apply the model, a rich model that gives results that's efficient in uh, how it is applied. And this arts in health paradigm, this collaboration paradigm, this paradigm that allows us to reach more people should be extended to as much as possible. Thank you very much indeed to all of you on my own behalf and on behalf of Tony Ramos, who whom I apologize for uh, for his absence here today, but we'll leave you with these two email addresses in case you want to get in touch with us. Thank you.